I think the biggest difference is when I started doing robotics, it was all about factory automation, right? And so they were arm type robots and they were doing assembly. And we did some early work on force control. So how do you get a, a robot, an arm robot holding a grinding tool, you know, to take a burr off a piece of metal. And that was relatively sophisticated problem at that particular time because a robot had to have a sense of of force uh, where most robots are able to control their position very accurately we need to, to be able to control the force so that was really that's where I got started in robotics and all the applications people talked about were in factories and over the course of my career which is probably 20 30 years something like that embarrassingly big number uh, ro robots have moved out of factories into all sorts of other application domains and where I spent probably the, the longest solid period of my career was looking at getting robots into the mining industry and there were lots of reasons for that productivity and safety and so we looked at massive machines for doing uh, earth moving excavation and underground uh, haulage vehicles so yeah robots come out of factories and into other sorts of domains uh, mining my work at the moment is a lot around getting robots in agriculture but we see you know people building robot cars uh, and there are all sorts of robot companies starting up, big robot competitions from you know, high school kids through to competitions for academics such as run by DARPA. So really the scope of robotics has just exploded. Editor-in-Chief job was actually pretty nice. I was Editor-in-Chief of the Robotic and Automation magazine and I enjoyed that because it's a little different to a traditional journal. And over the time that I was Editor-in-Chief, I was trying to transition it from being, a, from thinking of itself as a journal that published, uh, that published papers to a magazine that published articles. And you could say they're just words, but the, the semantics are important here and your paper is something that's got oftentimes the way people like to express themselves in that community. It's got a lot of equations, it's got a lot of references, it's pretty dense. People write in a very defensive way. Uh, they sort of put up this armor around them. Where for an article, I think you're being a little more a little more frank, a little bit more direct in your communication with the reader. Less equations, ideally no equations, you know, very few references. So trying to change the mindset of the community to say we respect an article. You don't have to write something with lots of equations, lots of references. So we made some, some small progress there. So it was nice to be able to have as editor-in-chief the, the scope, uh, the, the freedom to be able to, to do that. Uh, other editorial roles, I think the biggest problem we face is getting people to do reviews in a timely manner. I'm not sure any other person editorial role you talk to uh, in this exercise will tell you exactly the same thing. People are just super busy and you know, some of them will tell you right away I can't do the review but the worst case is people just don't even answer your emails and so you don't know whether they're going to do the review or not. The review period blows out, the, the authors get angry uh, and it's really not very, it's not very satisfactory. And I don't know what the answer is because a number of articles being submitted to journals is just next will be going up well we can't stop that and we shouldn't try and stop it there are more people on the planet publishing which means that there are more people theoretically who should be able to do the reviews but it's not scaling right right so the articles are going up like this but the number of people willing to do reviews isn't, isn't going up so some journals are doing a lot of summary rejects so the editor-in-chief just says I don't think this is even worth sending out to review if you consider that the reviewing is a really precious resource uh, if I can save two reviews, because this paper is clearly not over the bar, but then it becomes a sort of dictatorship then, instead of you know, going out to review by your peers, it's now being assessed by one person, uh, judge and jury, and I think it's not right, but it's the only way we can get by. So that's, that's the toughest part of the editorial process. <laughs> Interesting question. I, I think the traditional publishers are, are struggling. They've had a business model that's been good for a long period of time. I think they 
I don't think they quite know what's coming and I don't think they have quite figured out how to adapt to the new world. The music industry is probably a salutary lesson. It's probably what should keep them awake at night. Open access, I'm not sure it's been quite as successful as everyone would have liked. I think a lot of academics expressed, I think, justifiable frustration or anger with the traditional publishers because they said, look, we're doing all the work. We write the articles, uh, we do the reviews, we're on the editorial boards, uh, and then you, you, know, you guys make all the money and sell it back to us. You know, how stupid is that? And so then there was movement to create electronic journals where you don't have any publishers at all, open access where you don't have the fees. But I, I think what's happened is that the, a lot of the, the new open access journals don't have yet the stature. And so if I was a young researcher and I had some work that I wanted to publish, uh, and I want to get it on my CV so that I can be promoted, I want to put it into a good journal. And the good journals at the moment are all the traditional model because you know they've got their name is well established, they've got good editorial boards, you know, famous editors in chief or whatever. So that's where people want to send them because the prestige of the editorial board rubs off on them. It basically is a stamp of approval by that editorial board on my work. So until the open access journals can get uh, editorial boards of, of stature, I think they're going to struggle. And the people who have the stature are really, really busy and they're pretty comfortable in the, with the traditional board roles they have. It's a matter of getting to move across. Or the new generation, uh, you know, as they grow up and develop stature, they populate the boards of the, uh, the new journals, then maybe it will take off. Sure. I think there's, there's a few aspects to why I, I moved into agriculture. I think part of it is is maybe some small amount of guilt for having spent a decade trying to work uh, at more pro productive ways of getting uh, coal out of the ground. Uh, <laughs> maybe I should uh, sort of restore the karmic balance and, uh, and do something uh, a little greener. Uh, my country is a big food producer and we're a net food exporter and you look at all the statistics around food production, uh, number of people on the planet going, you know, is, is going up and up, uh, maybe not quite as quickly as it used to. Numbers like by 2050, we need to produce 40% more food than we're producing now. In my country, within a decade, half our farmers will retire. They're very old and their kids don't want to become, become farmers. So we need, to produce, uh, we need to produce more food because there are more mouths, we're going to have less farmers. All around the world there's less land to farm because we're building houses on it to hold all the extra people uh, water is in shorter and shorter supply climate's changing so it's a tough it's a tough problem and I think robotics could contribute quite significantly to to that there's a lot of labor intensive intense <laughs> there's a lot there's a lot of uh, labor intensivity in in agriculture and that's that's problematic in and there's different types of agriculture there's broad acre agriculture like you grow a wheat field and it's massive right and you have big big machines so we're doing some work there because there's problems with big big machines uh, they're very expensive uh, they're actually not that reliable and the big heavy machines actually crush the soil so that soil where they drive backwards and forwards becomes very unproductive so that project that we're involved in is looking at ways of producing swarms of small, low-cost robots that will do the job of the big robot. So big robot breaks, you're in trouble. If you've got 100 little robots in your farm, one breaks, well, you've got 99 left. That, that's pretty good. It's not going to crush the soil so much. Also, if these robots move more slowly through the environment, instead of big machines, and these are huge, they may be 30 metres wide, going 20, 30 kilometres an hour, spraying herbicide to suppress weeds. Uh, they go quickly. A lot of the herbicide is wasted. It gets in the environment. It's not going where it should go. Small machines going much more slowly can actually look on an individual basis at a plant and figure out what kind of plant it is, good plant, good plant or bad plant, and apply just the amount of herbicide that's needed for that particular plant. So in some ways, 
going back to the way agriculture was in the Middle Ages, where you had lots of uh, you had a lot of labour force working on the land, they go and attend to every individual plant and give it personal treatment. I think in the future, robots may be able to give personal treatment to plants. May be able to dramatically reduce the amount of herbicide that we apply to plants, which is a good thing for the environment and it's a big, take, big cost take out for the farmer. Uh, the other area that's really important to look at is they call horticulture, so that's the business of producing, amongst other things, fruit. So in fruit picking, you've got a particular time and the fruit becomes ready and then you've got to take them off the tree. So you need a lot of labor very quickly uh, to do the work. And fruit growers, in my country at least, really struggle with getting a labor force to do that. So the, most of the labor force are young Europeans on backpacking holidays in Australia and you know they they're the workforce that they have and that's a frustrating workforce because they're young and they want to party and they don't really want to work hard and you can't necessarily get the number you need when the fruit's ready because you can't tell a month in advance when the fruit's going to be ready so the growers really have problems with getting enough workers so again if robots could do that job that would be that'd be awesome so that's the other aspect of our agricultural work Absolutely. I think one of the problems with trying to understand the environmental health of our planet is just getting enough data. And I think at the moment our understanding is data, data limited. We do fantastic things with satellites and uh, hyperspectral imagery, but that's observing the Earth from a long distance. And you make an inference from what the satellite sees as to the condition on the ground. Robots and sensor networks can measure the condition on the ground uh, much more cost effectively than, than human beings can. One of my colleagues, Matthew Dumbabin, has been doing some fantastic work with robotic boats surveying lakes and measuring the amount of methane that's emitted from the lakes. And you know, he's able to discover interesting things about which parts of the lake emit methane and at which particular times of the day. And they do it at mor morning and evening. And when you're starting to do greenhouse gas accounting and you've got lots of lakes emitting methane, nobody knew before that lakes emitted methane or how much they emitted. So now we can do that. And it's only because we had a boat that was patient enough to go over the lake all day, all night, measuring when the methane comes up. The normal human manual way of doing the process was you send out some guys once and they take a measurement from the boat and then maybe they come back six months later. So you don't sample quickly enough, you can't see these natural phenomena. So this is where robots and sensor networks are are really, really powerful. It's an area that I, I got really interested in in my previous job when I was at CSIRO. I've not been able to pursue that as much as I like in my current place, I'm trying to start a new group and get into the agriculture thing. It's something I'd really very much like to get back to. I think it's a really important application for robotics. And there's a few people within the community who are quite passionate about this. We've had some special issues and there are workshops on the topic. So I think it's something that's growing in awareness within the robotic community. Sure, it's a really exciting opportunity that came our way just before Christmas of, of last year. So we won a substantial amount of money, uh, but importantly, it's funding for a long period of time. It's funding for seven years get to work with three other really great universities uh, in Australia and a really excellent team of chief investigators, uh, some you know, great uh, upcoming younger researchers and also some you know, more senior researchers who some of them have spent you know, significant amounts of time overseas. So a really great diverse range of investigators. Uh, I'm the director and it's my job to try and marshal all of this and bring the centre into existence. It's really still in startup phase so we're still very much in recruiting and we've been putting out advertisements we're looking for a lot of postdocs and then we'll be looking for a lot of phd students and we've been doing a lot of recruiting here at icra handing out flyers and putting advertisements on the ends of our talks we've been pretty shameless uh in trying to get you know sort of the best and brightest people in the world the topic for the center is robotic vision and it goes back to a bit what i was talking about earlier that we want to see vision become the sensing modality of choice for robots. 
So you know, robots use expensive sensors like lasers and whatever. We'd like to see robots using cameras. And there are some real problems with that. We still don't know how to reliably process the data that comes from a camera in order to tell us what's what in the world. Uh, and there's really big problems there in, in image understanding. What are the objects within the scene? Interesting problems around the linkage between seeing and moving. So I use my sight in, to help me move, to walk, to pick things up. But I also use moving to help me see. If I don't quite know what I'm looking at, I move my head or something like that. So it's links between seeing and moving. We want to explore that. So I want to understand also this notion of context. That it, I know what context I'm in and I use that to help me see better. I know I'm in a room and the things that I would expect to see in a room. Uh, people, chairs, water bottles, whatever, but not an elephant or a tiger or a car. And similarly, if I'm outdoors and driving, then I expect to see particular things. So I think it's useful to know the context to help us see. But in order to work out the context, you're only going to use my vision to find the context. So it's another interesting circular problem. So lots of really interesting things to look at. Seven years, a lot of money and smart people. I, I hope we'll get a lot done. I want to see this done before I retire. <laughs>
There's a bunch of there's a bunch of issues in there. I think academics often stress about not being enough engaged with industry. I, uh, I think in this particular field of robotics, I think they are sufficiently engaged. Academia is different to industry. So if you want to do highly relevant industrial research, you should go and work for industry. Uh, but I think that the work you do in academia should at least be informed by real problems, and that happens best if you have some sort of formal relationship with industry. So having some, some funding for industry I think is a good way of keeping you honest and grounded, but I think if all your work, all your funding comes from industry, I'm not sure you're going to be an effective academic. I'm not sure you can you know, freely choose the questions you want to work on and address them. So I think for an academic a good balance is to, to have some industry funding, but also to have some funding that lets you fr leaves you free to pursue you know, questions that are you know, at the moment unfettered by application. I think an early boss of mine when I was at, at, at CSIRO, a guy called Malcolm Good, he was very influential to me. He taught me, he taught me a lot about control and dynamics. He was supportive when I wanted to go on, an, on a study trip overseas. And I ended up going to the grass lab at University of Pennsylvania. And there, uh, Professor uh, Lou Paul, Richard Paul, uh, he was the guy that I worked with there. And he was he's the loveliest man, very gentle, very smart. And you know, I, learned, I learned a lot from him. So I think he's probably the most influential person uh, on, my, on my career as a roboticist. And I went there before I had a PhD, which is kind of an unusual thing to do. And I came back and then I was excited uh, about doing a PhD. And so, and, and I did. And Malcolm Good, who'd been my boss, he then moved to the university. So then he was my professor. And uh, I did my PhD under, under his supervision. Uh, other ro roboticists who influ influenced me, uh, I think, uh, Is Isama Khatib. Uh, very much. I learned a lot from Osama. John Hollaback, I have a lot of respect for and work with him on an editorial board. Other roboticists that I don't know so well are you know, Rodney Brooks and Takeo Kanade are just you know, inspirational figures I think in, in robotics. They think very big, th they think very big thoughts uh, and, and they bring them to, to reality uh, in different kind of ways. Rod very much through some very early controversial papers and big ideas, but also his work in industry at iRobot and now uh, Rethink Robotics. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's, a, that's probably a, a, a much bigger list, but they're the ones that come immediately to mind. Okay, it's probably the robot from Lost in Space, and I don't know what its name is, but it's the robot from Lost in Space, and everyone knows that, knows that robot if you say, say that. Uh, I grew up with that. Uh, it was, I guess when I grew up, space, exploration, all of those things were really exciting and, and robots were, were, were being thought about. Uh, and it's taken a long time to catch up with, with those you know, fictional depictions of robots from the 60s. There were lots of them on television at that time. The Jetsons, Jaime the Robot in, in, uh, in Get Smart, the robot Lost in Space, you know, they're sort of the ones that come to mind. And because I grew up with them, I guess that's why they're, they're my favorites. Yeah, I think I've done okay not being, not being an astronaut. I think being, uh, being a robotics professor is, is pretty good. The whole space thing didn't pan out the way we were told. Right? When I was a kid, you know, we'd be going for holidays on the moon and there'd be space stations going around the Earth by like 1976 or something. And it didn't happen. So... Yeah, I think the space thing was a bust. <laughs> uh, congratulate you on your on your tenth anniversary. Uh, hope the next ten years goes even even better. It's a really exciting time for for robotics. Uh, I think I've been in it for a long time, and it's it's had some some ups and downs. But the ups have been you know generally very very slow, and then. Sometimes the, the hype and the expectation gets beyond the reality and it leads to, led to a bit of a crash and that happened sort of late 80s and 90s. Uh, 
but now I think there is just so much excitement around. There's a lot of businesses now uh, in the in the robotics area, and all these diverse applications. Um, then we're going to see robots, houses, offices, hospitals, all around us in society. In the next ten, I think in ten years' time, we'll look back. Maybe we won't look back, but we just look around us, and we'll see a lot of robots, and most people won't be surprised. It's like the smartphone hasn't been around that long, 2007. Right, but now we just take it completely for granted. Can't imagine what life was like before that. So I think in 10 years time, we'll look around, there'll be robots. And we'll think, is there a time when there weren't robots? And it will be very surprising to us. So yeah, really exciting times ahead. Very happy birthday to International Journal for Advanced Robotic Systems.